All right. Um, we are about to begin our final session. Um, it is also somebody who's returning on stage from yesterday. Uh, you might have met Stephanie Nemeth yesterday at the uh, AI panel. Um, and she, uh, this talk, I am so looking forward to this. Um, this I don't want to set up any expectations, and we'll hope that all of the demos work. Um, but I am so looking forward to this talk. So Stephanie is a bit of a hacker. Um, you know, she builds cool things, uh, makes art projects. Um, she's also a software engineer at GitHub, and also very strong. <laughs> and comes with an assistant, a uh, very powerful person. Um, let's everyone give it for Stephanie's assistant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Stephanie, would you like me to keep talking or um, are we sort of getting there? I mean, I think hopefully we're good. I, if you've never given a talk with hardware, like, I mean, I hope it works. It worked before the talk, so. <laughs> All right, well, we've had very good luck with hardware so far in this conference, so I'm sure that this, uh, <laughs> this one will go great. Uh, everyone, give a big welcome and applause for Stephanie. Oh, uh, just one second. I forgot I need to screen record. <laughs> one second. I'm not actually sure. Gosh. Um, this is awkward. Uh, it's okay, it's not awkward at all. I think that's the right display. You get to see a preview of all my slides. Okay, and now we're back on track. Okay, so uh, yeah, I realize this is the last talk and it has a really weird title. So I really appreciate you sticking around. Um, I'm sure you're tired after two days. I'm tired. This is the most people I've been around in like over three years because of COVID. <laughs> um, yeah, so like Yanni said, I'm Stephanie. I am a software engineer at Microsoft. I work at GitHub. I work on completely normal things at GitHub. I work on projects and issues. And my pronouns are she, her. I live in Berlin. And I think one thing that's important to know about this talk uh, as I start out is that I'm a career changer. And I've always had a lot of insecurities around that. Um, like when you're starting out and you already feel, it's not a good place to already feel like you're behind when you're starting out because you're switching from another career. And I would always compare myself with other devs and their career progress. And this created a lot of anxiety and self-doubt in myself and led to me feeling kind of like always inadequate like in my job and just as a coder. Um, and, but early in my career, I impulsively bought my first Raspberry Pi when I saw that coding and hacking things could be cute and rainbowy and colorful. And honestly, this is the best thing I did for my career and my self-esteem. I could start building things for myself, by myself, where I could feel safe to write bad code and figure out things by myself without judgment. And I kind of developed this mindset of, it's kind of a toxic mindset, but it kind of worked for me at the time that I might not be the smartest dev, but I'm going to be the quirkiest dev. And this just kind of helped me build up confidence in myself. So I just started making a bunch of little interactive hardware projects, and I mainly worked work with LEDs. Um, and a common theme through this whole talk and my whole making career is most of my projects started as impulsive ideas. I see something, I think it's interesting, I make a late night purchase, and then it shows up and I start building. Um, but most of them have deeper meaning, and they've helped me process serious things about myself that I struggle with, like social awkwardness and loneliness. And being different and, st and struggling with depression and this anxiety didn't mean anything was wrong with me. It just mean my brain worked differently, but it took a long time for me to actually realize this. Um, last year I was diagnosed with ADHD, and this is only after I started, my, um, started dating my neurodivergent partner, which is also my roadie, helping me out. Um, and ADHD just means my brain has lower levels of dopamine than a neurotypical brain. And uh, unfortunately, women are terribly undiagnosed. 
like 75% of women with ADHD go undiagnosed, and if they're lucky enough to get diagnosed, it's not until later in life, until they're in their 30s or 40s. And having undiagnosed ADHD caused me a lot of difficulties in life, uh, like self-created difficulties a lot of time, but it also means I have this incredible drive and curiosity about my environment. And I love how I am, and understanding myself better has been empowering personally, and it's helped me be able to navigate my career growth better now that I understand myself better. So today, I want to talk about my two projects, this giant pom-pom and this eating display, and then the other one I'm calling the hamster walkie-talkies. Both are made using mainly JavaScript, only the pom-pom is an Arduino, it's, not, it's using Python. Um, it's completely ridiculous to use JavaScript to build these things, but you can. Um, and I built these because I wanted to explore communication using soft things, because I like touching soft things. It feels nice. Um, and I wanted to use them as triggers or means for exchanging messages with others. And the motivation is my partner will be moving away for half a year in a few months, and I just want to continue to maintain a high level of connection. And one way that my ADHD affects me is that I really struggle maintaining contact and messaging people consistently, even people I really love and like. And I carry a lot of shame with that. Um, basically, if I don't respond immediately to a message, it's lost, and then I feel terrible, and then I just I think about the message, but I just don't, don't ever respond. Um, so I wanted to experiment to see if I could create new ways for me to communicate that are fun for me and would be fun for others, and to see if it would help me help motivate me to stay connected in a more consistent manner, and also create a fun experience for everyone. And I'm going to start. I'm going to talk about the pom pom I made first. And I tried to present this in the most sequential way possible, but I didn't necessarily build this in a sequential manner. Um, it was a lot of working on both projects kind of simultaneously back, bouncing back and forth and debugging. And yeah, it was just like less structured, but that would be very chaotic storytelling. So I'm just going to talk about this sequentially. Oh, yeah, this is a reminder for me to actually demo. Um, so uh, when I hug this big pom-pom, uh, it takes on a little bit of a delay. But uh, it should update the display in a few seconds. Um, I guess just give me a thumbs up if it actually <laughs> displays in a second. It should flash, and then it should update. Um, it, if not, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how demos go sometimes. Um, so this is how it's actually working. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> OK, one down. <laughs> um, I have a just a really tiny Wi-Fi-enabled Arduino tucked inside of the pom-pom. Um, it's plugged in right now. That's just to make sure it works. It doesn't, it has a battery in there. It doesn't actually have to be plugged in. It just detects touch, and it just sends a message to the picture frame, which in the back, I, here you can see it has demystify here. There's like a Raspberry Pi tucked in there and the e-ink display. And yeah, it just sends a message to the picture frame. The Raspberry Pi makes a chat, uh, API request to chat GPT, and then it just updates the display. Um, so making a giant pom-pom, fun. It takes it took days. Uh, you just cut out a cardboard, uh, lots of yarn. If you want to make it touch sensitive, make sure you get some a conductive thread. There's a special thread that um, is conductive, and you need to just you don't have to wrap it thoroughly, but you just need to mix it in so it's between the fibers as well. And then I just uh, stuck the Arduino inside of the pom-pom and attach the thread. And all of these projects, um, I mean, most of my projects so far, and definitely these two, are using MQTT. 
Uh, it's been around since 1999. It's a lightweight published subscribe messaging protocol. I, I love it. It's great for working in hardware because it's meant to work in like environments where the Wi-Fi is not good or there's like high latency and there's client libraries in any language I would want to use, um, but particularly JavaScript, Python, CircuitPython, Arduino, C++. And uh, you basically, you can have multiple clients and then you just set up a broker. And that handles like the messaging routing. And you can build your own MQTT broker. I've done that, you don't have to. There's great cloud solutions. And for like a hobbyist like me, using something like HiveMQ just makes sense because you get a lot of bandwidth uh, free every month and it's secure. Um, yeah, so you can just use the cloud. So, uh, this is the code that's running in the pom pom. This is CircuitPython. Uh, it's just a special flavor of Python for hardware. And uh, it's really simple. It just connects to the Wi Fi, connects to the MQTT client. It checks if it was woken up by this uh, touch. And then it just sends a message to the broker saying I was touched. And then it recreates the same alarm again, and then it goes to sleep. And then it just waits to get touched again, and it just runs this, and that's it. Uh, on the Raspberry Pi, again, set up an MQTT client. Uh, it subscribes to this touch message. It also subscribes to the update message because um, I built this in duplicates. So, I mean, you can build this in triplicate, quadruplicate, or how many ever you wanted, and each one could be sending messages to the other. So I have the touch because it has its own pom-pom attached to it. And then just the update is just to update all the displays wherever they're at. So um, when it receives a touch, that's when I make the call to OpenAI, to ChatGPT. Um, if you haven't played around with the API, I mean, it's not very many lines of code to, to make a request. Um, and the, I mean, the hardest part was just coming up with a prompt. I originally wanted to do something like really heartfelt and meaningful, but it sounded so fake and so insincere. I think I'm just terrible at prompt engineering, which I mean, it's supposed to be natural language. It doesn't feel like you should have to put that much effort into prompt engineering, but. So I just decided, let's just do, it's doing ASCII art and like some kind of mysterious, weird, motivational motto of a few words. Um, so, and then this is after it makes the chat GPT request, uh, and gets a response back, it sends the other message to the MQTT broker, which all the displays are subscribed to to update. And when it gets that message, um, this is like the most important bit. It just triggers it to, um, to update the display. It triggers uh, the, I'm using an embedded JavaScript template um, just to display whatever message it gets back. That just gets re-rendered. It's just a, a simple express server uh, that just re-renders. And then I use, uh, there, for the e-ink display, there's a JavaScript library al already that you can use called ePaperJS. And that actually uses Puppeteer. And it just, once it re-renders, it takes a screenshot and the screenshot, that image, is what is loaded onto the e-ink display. That's it. And I mean, you can use this. There's all kinds of cool things you could do with this, like e-ink display with JavaScript. And I know the messages are hard to see. And then also, they would kind of be created and destroyed. So I just, before the talk, I just quickly made a little Mastodon account. If you want to see the kind of messages and ASCII art that it creates sometime, you feel free to check it out. And OK, I can't wait to talk about the hamster walkie-talkies. Um, again, this was an impulse buy. I was, uh, so I live in Berlin. I was watching this German show where basically these comedians are locked into a room for six hours and they're trying not to laugh. If they get laughed, they get kicked out and it's ridiculous. And this one comedian brought this talking hamster, which I guess had been around for a few years, but I had never seen it. And then he was just having heated arguments with, this, with himself, with this hamster. And the hamster has a high-pitched voice. I thought it was hilarious at the time and I bought one. 
And once I got it, I found I really like talking to this hamster because then it talks back to you in this really cute, high-pitched voice. I would be super annoying, and I'd like to talk to my partner through the hamster. And this all sounds ridiculous until you try it. And I uh, actually looked up about these hamsters. They're actually really good for kids or uh, neurodivergent people, autistic people, uh, just to help or people doing learning languages, just because it gives you this kind of safe space to practice social interactions and practice speaking. So I'm just, I don't know, I'm just a huge advocate of these like little cheap talking hamster toys. And, um, oh, I need to demo. Um, <laughs> I hope this works. Um, let's just see. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, basically, I just wanted these hamsters to be walkie talkie. So I talk to one, it records audio, and it sends it to the other, and it plays it. And this doesn't have to be two hamsters, I mean, it could be a whole network of hamsters, um, I don't know. Um, and I did not have any of this figured out when I started, and I also have to say, I started building these projects because I got invited to speak at the conference like two and a half months ago, so I also have no concept of time <laughs> or how long things will take. Uh, but I had never, the tricky part was I had never worked on audio project before. I'm pretty clueless about it. I like LEDs, I like light. I'm not musically talented. I don't really understand sound. Uh, so I wasn't really sure how I was gonna send the audio when I started. I didn't know if I was going to do like speech to text and then on the other hamster, like do text to speech. I didn't really wanna do that because I wanted to be the person that says his voice is being spoken over the hamster. Um, so I just kind of started with the things I knew how to do and just um, trusted myself to find out a solution. And uh, first thing to do is to take apart, the ham take apart the hamster and see what you are working with. Because I wanted to keep the, the hamster voice filtering and that is on this board already. Um, so I wanted to still use this board so I would have that effect but this board isn't hackable. It's, um, it doesn't have Wi-Fi. I need to send messages. I need Wi-Fi. So I was going to have to figure out how to use this mic input. So I would need to remove its current mic and then add in my own solution where I could uh, do all these things with the sending the message and getting the audio and then play it through here. So I use a Raspberry Pi Zero W. This is a very old Pi. Um, they're at least five years old. If you didn't know, there's a pie shortage, so it's kind of hard to get new Raspberry Pis right now. And also, I didn't want to have to, to, I wanted to show that you don't have to use the newest boards to make something wonderful. And you can run Node.js on this board. You just have to use, because you just have to use the unofficial builds. Um, because it, it has the chip architecture is just a little different, so you have to use un unofficial builds. But I'm running Node 18 on this board. And I started with the mic because I needed to get sound in to be able to send it. And I used this, it's, it's an I2S MIMS mic, and that's just, uh, the main thing to know about this mic is it just records in digital. So I didn't have to do any analog to digital conversion. And in my Node app, I, to trigger recording, I just spawn a child task, a, a, a child process. And I use the already built-in CLI uh, tool that's on uh, Raspberry Pi's operating system called, and also Linux, called A-Record. And I just record to a wave file. And the next thing I wanted to do is when I hold his little paw, I wanted that to be, when I'm holding, touching it, it records. So I, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have any kind of capacitive touch built in to the pins, so I need to add this touch sensor board. And 
I was really pleasantly surprised that Adafruit, uh, which is great for the, is a great company that makes all kinds of boards, they had already ha made a JavaScript package, uh, a Node PM, uh, a Node package that um, I could use. It was quite old. It hadn't been updated in like seven years. But I mean, this code kind of doesn't change that much. I just had so I could just fork it and update the few dependencies that it had, and then it worked on my board and. To use JavaScript to detect touch is really this few lines of code. I just um, monitor whichever pin I have the wire attached to that I'm going to hook to his paw. And it just it knows when it's touched, and it knows when it's released. And that's what I use to trigger the recording and stop the recording. OK, so I, had, I could get audio in when I touch it. Now I needed to get the audio out to the hamster. And this is where I learned a lot about audio. The Pi Zero is great. It's, I mean, you can kind of see on the back of the hamster, it's just in this little pouch. It's tiny. It's a fully operational bo uh, computer. But it doesn't have an audio jack. It doesn't have any kind of pads on it that you can solder to get like analog audio signal out. Um, but you can use uh, these pins on it called PWM to get audio out. And it's just easiest for me to read a definition so I don't garble up these words, but PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation. It's an entirely digital way of representing an analog value as a chain of pulses whose width is proportional to the analog value being expressed. In itself, it's not an analog signal, though it is simple to convert it to one by passing it through a low-pass filter whose cutoff frequency is the maximum frequency of the analog signal. OK, so basically that means uh, human audible range uh, frequencies is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. And the PWM output from the Pi is around 50 megahertz. So to get analog audio from this digital signal, I just needed to filter out the values over that we can't hear, over 20,000 hertz. And a low-pass filter sounds fancy. It's nothing fancy. It's just the circuit on the right. It's just some, a couple of capacitors and two um, resistors. And I only needed to create half of the circuit because I'm just doing mono. I'm not doing two channels. It's just mono, not stereo. So I just had to build half of it. So I had the analog um, audio output, but I still needed to get it into that mic uh, input on the hamster. And then I learned about what line level is. So audio, like uh, analog audio from the Pi, or is, is that a thing called line level? And line level means it's between 0.5 volts to 2 volts. And the mic input has a mic level of around 10 millivolts. So I need to create a, a voltage divider to reduce the voltage to match that of the mic input. Now, I could have fed this higher voltage into the mic input. It would be really loud and distorted. It would not sound good. It would probably make some sound. It probably wouldn't destroy the hamster, but it's just not going to sound good. So I need to make this adjust adjustment. It was a lot of trial and error. But a voltage divider, again, is just using combinations of resistors and capacitors to reduce the voltage. And this is actually the circuit that I built. And I just soldered the bottom tips across the positive and negative of the hamster mic um, inputs. And then where my finger is, that's I put the wire from the Pi, that's a capacitor right there going in. And that's just what I soldered on the board. And yeah, to play audio is kind of the same thing, but the reverse from when I recorded. I, again, I just spawn a child process in my app. And uh, instead of a record, I use a play, this command line tool on the Raspberry Pi. And I, once again, use MQTT uh, to send the messages. Uh, in this Node app I'm using, the library is MQTTJS client, and you can send uh, message payloads as strings or buffers, and buffers are just bytes. And you can send up to 256 megabytes, which is well over 
however big a 10 second wave file uh, transformed into a buffer would be. Um, so I could record and play the wave files, but I needed to record uh, to convert this recorded audio to a buffer, and then once the other hamster received it, I would need to convert it back to a wave file. And um, yeah, I it, again, it's I mean, it's unbelievable to me how it's just so many so few lines of code. This is like such a short app to do all this. Uh, I basically just, uh, I used a library, this WAV file, uh, NPM library, just because um, not an audio person, WAV files, uh, they need, there's certain like byte orders and there's like a header on the front, and just to make sure everything was like as it was supposed to be and would work best, because I wasn't sure if I was actually recording it in the right settings. Um, I just wrapped the file that I had recorded in this WAV file um, constructor and then change all of that to a buffer. It has, this, it has a, a, a two buffer there that takes care of all the like bit order and, and everything. Um, and then I just publish that message with MQTT. And then when I receive it, I just do the opposite. I just use like the, the Milton uh, FS library in Node and I just write the file from the buffer directly to uh, a WAV file and it just plays that, it just works. And then the last thing I did, I added this, maybe you saw it when I was recording, I added this little LED so I would know it was actually recording. And uh, this was such a little thing, but it was such kind of a pain. LEDs, uh, these programmable LEDs, NeoPixels, uh, you can run them on Raspberry Pis, but they can be like a little temperamental and tricky, especially I was using all these other I2C, I2S, PWM, I'm like, and using all these other communication pro protocols on this little tiny board, the only thing left to use was uh, SPI. I won't bore you with that, but if you wanna hear about like weird debugging, like just come talk to me at the after party, like, uh, but, it, but it works. Um, and we're at the end of my talk, and <laughs> I just want to say, even if you aren't neurodivergent, I encourage you to follow silly ideas, even if you don't have a plan, and even if you don't know all the details. Like, if you were around for Taro's wonderful talk yesterday evening, he, said, he started by saying, you can just try a bunch of random things and experiment until you find something that you like. And I encourage you to do that, because curiosity is powerful to build confidence. And you'll probably learn some stuff about yourself along the way. Thank you, and you can reach out to me. I have my code. Happy to talk. I'll be at the after party. I may or may not bring the hamsters. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was wonderful. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, first question from me. Um, do the hamsters have names? Yes. So this one, his name is Heinrich, but he goes by Heine. And this is Hamburg, because um, my partner will be going to Ham Hamburg. <laughs> and he's also like a little cyborg from, I don't know, Star Trek. I don't know. I don't watch that. So it's his thing. That's his hamster. Um, yeah. But Heine's mine. I love Heine. <laughs> nice. Uh how many hamsters uh, have fallen during the development? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, there's, okay, well, it's tricky because I love this style of hamster the most. This board was not hackable because the microphone was actually embedded into like the PCB and I couldn't hack it. So I had to buy this other looking hamster, which I don't think is as cute. Uh, I don't know, I have, and I have hamsters as backup parts. I think I have at least, um, I think I have like uh, four or five extra hamsters at home. <laughs> it's a mess, it's a mess. Uh, so some hamsters were harmed during the- Yeah, there were some sacrifices. Yes. Um, uh, there is an actual question about the construction of hamsters. Okay. Um, how do you pitch up the audio and make the hamster move? Is that built into the hamster? The, okay, the movement and the filter, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, that's built in. So it just has like a, a motor. This When it's just on, it just turns the motor on and that's it. It's just built in. And I just kept that because I liked it. 
Nice. All right. So that was all the audience questions. I'm sure that they have uh, many questions they can ask you in person. Before we go away, we have a couple more things. We'll soon invite Juho on stage to, to, to close the conference. But before that, could we have a hamster close the conference? Okay. Is that, can we try I that? I mean, do you want to do it? Yeah, I can yeah, okay. do it. Okay. I mean, this, do this one because this one sounds better. You just hold his paw right here and while, the, just like this. And we we'll just wait. And then when it's green, you can record. Just get kind of close to him. You have to hold it. Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. Okay, do it again. Oh, wait, you have to, sorry. You have to, you have to hold his hand. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you for coming to Future Frontend. I you for coming to Future. Oh, oh, sorry, I should have told. You can't have a big pause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie, uh, and thank you coming to the future with us, indeed. Uh, wise, wise hamster Hamburg. Um. <laughs>